mixing to uh, stratification in the water column. So if the tides can overcome and destroy the ambient stratification in the water column, you'd fall more over here, where if stratification is very strong, you fall over here. So we're going to try to figure out where Cousse falls <laughs> on this diagram. There are two types of salinity gradients in an estuary. Uh, like I showed earlier, um, okay, well this plot, you have depth on the y-axis, distance along your transect, remember our transect goes along the estuary, uh, on the x-axis here, the colors are different salinities where warmer colors are saltier and colder colors are fresher waters, and these lines are isopay lines. So the two types of gradients you can have in an estuary are um, in a long estuary salinity gradient, where it's the difference of the salinity at the mouth of the estuary versus at the head of the estuary. And you can also have uh, vertical differences in salinity, which is what we call stratification, uh, which is the difference in salinity at the surface from at the bottom. So this data comes from our CPD transects, and uh, it shows the wide range in uh, seasonality in the estuary. Uh, so you'll see that in the fall, your isohalines are slightly tilted horizontally, which means that it's partially mixed. In the winter, you have that salt wedge type isohaline configuration, uh, where you have very strong discharge into the estuary. In the spring, you have a very strong, along estuary gradient. However, your isohalines are tilted vertically. So vertically, it's well mixed, even though there's very strong, along estuary gradient. And in the summer, you see mostly oceanic water in the estuary due to uh, the diminishing of freshwater inflow throughout the course of the dry season. So you have mostly oceanic water throughout the length of the estuary, and it's very well mixed. In terms of the strength of circulation, remember that freshwater inflow is the dominant term here. Uh, and we can look at uh, freshwater in input to Coos Bay uh, over the past 10 or so years. Uh, that's what these different color lines are showing. Discharge is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. Starting in October, going to August. And you'll notice that um, fresh, or freshwater input ramps up in the wet season, what you would expect, and then dies down and goes to virtually nothing during the dry season. So what does this mean for the uh, parameterization of Coos Bay? It means that Coos Bay has a wide range in estuarine types over the course of a year, which is really uh, interesting. In the winter, you see it being the salt wedge type estuary. In the fall and spring, it's more partially mixed. In the summer, you have this well-mixed or six regime, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, but just what you should take away from this is that there's a strong seasonality in the estuarine classification, and it's mainly due to the freshwater input. All right, so now that we've classified Coos Bay, and we have a rough idea that it's this highly seasonal system driven by discharge, we can take a closer look at the type of circulation that's going on in this estuary. So estuary circulation is a complicated thing. There's many different flows on different time scales. Uh, the strongest flow is the tidal flow, which in Coos Bay occurs twice a day, two highs and two lows. And uh, flows are on an order of one meter per second. In addition to tidal flows, you have this estuary exchange flow, which is driven by the buoyancy input from the river, driving in a long estuary gradient. Uh, which is a pressure gradient and drives this uh, circulation here. You have salty water coming in at depth and fresher water buoyantly riding out over it. As that fresh water buoyantly rides out over the salty water, uh, some of that salty water can be mixed up and entrained into the fresher water. So another term for this estuarine circulation is residual flow. Uh, and we call it the residual flow because it's a residual to the tidal flow. It's a, an order of magnitude less than the tides. So it, it occurs on these longer time scales where you see uh, changes in the long estuary gradient 
driving different, um, different magnitudes of exchange flow. And we can compute these exchange flows by using some of the logger data uh, that we have. Uh, what this plot shows, um, well, let's talk about computing this first. So this is the residual flow or estuary exchange circulation. And it's mainly uh, dependent on the long estuary gradient. And also depth plays a big part in, these, uh, in this estuary circulation. So throughout the course of the year, remember, we saw all those different gradients in the long estuary salinity. Uh, this shows the gradient between the South Slough logger and one of our other loggers. Uh, the salinity data has been tightly averaged to, or um, yeah, averaged over the tides so that we don't have our tidal influence here. This is just showing the residual. And you'll notice that uh, estuarine circulation is much stronger in the winter and then dies off into the summer. So you have the seasonal difference in uh, strength of estuarine circulation. Uh, you can also look at the residual flows using our ADCP, which is located right here. It's located slightly out of the channel. And the way that you read this, we have depth on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and the colors indicate velocity. Um, warmer colors are velocities out of the estuary. Uh, colder colors are velocities into the estuary. And when you have stronger colors, you're seeing greater magnitudes of velocities. And um, what you should notice with this graph is uh, in the winter, you have very strong magnitudes of velocities. And then as you proceed into the spring, as your discharge starts to diminish, see a softening of the colors here, which means that the magnitude of the estuarine circulation is also diminishing. And when you have less residual flow, that leads to longer residence times in the estuary, which can have implications for the dissolved oxygen levels of uh, the estuary. So in addition to the seasonal variability we see in estuarine circulation, uh, you may have noticed that there's some weird things going on in the data here. Uh, we also have synoptic variability in the residual flows, and we can explain this um, using wind data. So if you remember, remember back to the plot of Coos Bay, uh, the ADCP is located on this lower arm of the estuary where there's a long fetch where winds can kick up and uh, build up a force where they're going to drive the entire water column in one direction. So right here, you have the entire water column moving out of the estuary uh, at the same time there's a very strong southward wind. So these strong winds can actually cause the whole water column to move in one direction and totally eliminate that estuary circulation. Uh, that occurs at several different points. You also have the reverse happening when you have these strong northward winds, which we would expect to see in the winter, uh, blowing to the north, pushing cold water column in. So synoptic variability is present as well. You also have interannual variability in residual flows. So we've been taking um, measurements for about a year and a half, but these loggers have been there a little bit longer. And this is the same data that I showed before, just broken up uh, for 2012 and 2013. And you'll notice that uh, 2012, has much higher residual flows than 2013, which we can explain if you take a look at the discharge data. So what you have here are the winds, the cumulative precipitation over the course of the year, and the cumulative discharge over the course of the year for 2012 in blue and 2013 in green. And you'll notice that even though the precipitation is higher in 2013, discharge is much higher in 2012. And we, um, we attribute the dissociation between precipitation and discharge to watershed storage effects. Um, however, what's most important about this plot is the great difference in discharge between 2013 and 2012. And uh, that diminished estuarine circulation in 2013 uh, can also be seen in the estuarine data if you take a look at the temperature and salinity properties throughout the estuary, uh, you can see what's happening. So this is for 2012. This is logger data from right here. Uh, plotted on the y-axis, you have temperature. 
your x-axis, you have salinity. So your uh, points in the lower right-hand corner here would indicate oceanic water. So it's really salty, uh, much colder. And the points over on the fresher side of things are indicating riverine water. And the colors just indicate the different months. So you can notice how temperature and salinity varies throughout the course of the year, where you have more oceanic waters, saltier waters in the summer, and you have a wide range in uh, salinity during these uh, winter and spring months due to high freshwater input. But if you look at the 2012 data, which is in gray, overlaid with the 2013 data at that same water, you'll notice a huge difference. There's an entire like water mass missing in 2013. You're missing the coldest and saltiest water in the estuary, you're also missing the freshest water. So remember, our discharge was very low in 2013, so we're missing that, those freshest waters mixing with the salty waters. And because your estuarine circulation is diminished, that pumping, driving the fresh water in, and, or salty water in and fresh water out, is also diminished, so you don't have as much of that coldest, saltiest water uh, in the estuary. Alright, so now we know what type of estuary Coos Bay is, how it varies through the seasons, um, what sort of estuarine circulation it has, and how that varies both on synoptic, uh, seasonal, and interannual scales. We can see what this all means for uh, dissolved oxygen levels in Coos Bay. Spoiler alert! So, the spoiler is that there is no hypoxia in Coos Bay. <laughs> And you'll notice there's only one DO measurement, less than 2 milligrams per liter. 
There also is no trend in DO. Uh, R squared value is like nothing. So it's saying that uh, DO, there's no decline seen in the estuary at this point. In addition to the South Slough logger, uh, we can also look at DO at these other loggers. And we uh, see no instances of DO less than 2 milligrams per liter from 2011 to 2014. However, it is important and kind of interesting to note um, the temporal variability in dissolved oxygen levels. In the winter, your dissolved oxygen levels are high and not very variable. However, as you move into the dry season, your oxygen levels are all over the place. And we can attribute that to upwelling and relaxation events. When you have an upwelling event, it's bringing that low DO water up onto the shelf, which has more chance of it entering the estuary. And then when those upwelling winds subside, uh, that low water, low DO water is brought back off the shelf, and you're seeing higher values there too. So it's just kind of interesting to see the seasonal cycle uh, and variability in DO. You can also look at spatial DO uh, throughout the estuary. So this data is going to be from our CPD transects proceeding along the estuary. And what I've done is I've picked out minimum DO uh, measurement for each for each CCD uh, profile uh, as we proceed along the estuary. Uh, starting with the winter winter time spatial DO maps here. Uh, you see that in the winter, in February, in late November, and January, you have uh, DO very constant throughout the length of the estuary, and high for the most part. In the summer, in May, June, October, and September, you have DO decreasing with distance of estuary. And we attribute that to those longer residence times uh, that we saw diminished estuary circulation. So the longer the water is in the estuary, the longer um, time that biology has to act on it and draw the DO, DO down even further. And lastly, we have this very interesting um, time in the spring during April and March where you're seeing a pronounced low DO signal at the mouth. And once you go up estuary to about 15 kilometers where you round that bend, uh, your DO levels are high and consistent. And we can look at data during this time period. So this was taken April 27th, this particular one where it's most pronounced, um, April 27th, 2013. We can look at the wind data and uh, the logger data to get an idea of what was happening prior to our CPD transects. And what you'll notice is that the wind stress on the 23rd is strongly to the south, which means very upwelling, favorable wind blew right off the coast of the shelf there, and that's causing salinity and temperature, salinity to go up, temperature to go down, and oxygen to go down in the estuary. So what we see is this very strong upwelling event making its way into the estuary. Conclusions and implications. So we've learned that Coos Bay is a highly seasonal system where it's mostly partially mixed to well mixed, when discharge is moderate to low. There are times when it is a salt wedge, uh, when you have very high discharge into the estuary, like we saw in those winter months. Um, uh, variability in the estuary circulation on seasonal and interannual scales is primarily driven by the discharge. And synoptic variability uh, is driven by those wind events that we saw. And lastly, um, in terms of hypoxia in Coos Bay, uh, historically inconclusive. Uh, I don't really trust this data set that we have, uh, but there's not really much out there. Currently, we saw no uh, low DO along the length of the estuary. Uh, however, our sampling was limited to the main channel, so there might be low oxygen occurring in you know, stagnant, tight flats on the side but we're not, we didn't go there, so. Uh, and lastly, we can uh, attribute spatio-temporal variability in dissolved oxygen levels to upwelling events and uh, longer residence times in the summer. The implications of this research are, um, include uh, this, any sort of changes to the estuarine circulation uh, could 